Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea, we catch up with do-it-yourself visionary and engineer Tony Lissari to see what aquaponics can look like in your front yard. Tony created a home aquaponics system complete with wind turbines he designed himself. Oh, hi, Tony. Hi, nice to meet <laughs> How you. How are you doing? Yeah, this is my aquaponics. I grow everything we can here. Tomatoes, strawberries, um, all the different herbs, some broccoli, some arugula, uh, lettuces. And this was our lawn. And that lawn um, used to take up water and, uh, and we used to mow it. So Tony, why did you start this project? I mean, why did you turn your front yard In, into, into this an yes, aquaponics yes, system? Yes. Uh, well, I initially started with my wind turbines and my wind turbine design. And what they were is a way to produce your own power in a residential setting. A lot of people, um, they think they can't do it. Uh, here we have a lot of salt, so solar is not is, as easy to accommodate here. And so I looked into doing wind turbines. Um, and once I did that, the wind turbines took me to people who needed remote power. And I started seeing they had these little systems here and there. I go, I could do that. And so I took the lawn out and I built this. <laughs> and I wanted to show that people without an acre or two or three acres of land could do this in their own front yard. So it gets rid of that excuse, well, I live in a neighborhood, so I can't. You have something like this. If everybody does it, then we all can take care of you know, each other. Uh, he may, my next door neighbor may grow something that I don't have, papaya, which I don't have. And so I'll trade him fish or, or lettuce or something like that for that. We're getting our bananas from Ecuador and we grow them here in Maui. It's crazy. And how can that possibly be cost effective or even intelligent? And so if we can grow our own food here um, and the average person can do it without backbreaking labor, I spend five minutes out there a day. It's not a big deal. So if we can get people interested and I, I bring, I ask as many people as, you know, who want to walk through it and, and I'll take time to explain it to them because I think it's important that they can do it. And once they figure that they, hey, I have the power to do it, then they empower themselves and, and, and getting to the children is, is the key. Because if they come at home and they say, mommy, look what I learned, and then, you know, and put the parents on the spot a little bit. And how the system works is you have your fish down here, and this is about 1,200 gallon water of water, and this water, they do their business in the water, and then that water gets transferred up through these filters that I've made. This is much like an oil filter on a car, and it takes the solids out of the water. Once the water's been cleaned to the solids, it goes into these bioreactors here that then transfer the water along. It rains down onto river rock, and it transfers the water along the green canals and goes into the manifold at the end. Then initially comes through the strawberries, and these knuckles here regulate the water uh, level in these tubes, and then the water comes into here and fills them up. And so there's no dirt in this system, and it's just the roots. Oh, wow. And so the root takes up all the uh, nutrients. And can I stick my hand in the water? Oh, absolutely. And so the water is kind of a brownish color. Mm -hmm. This is a taro that I'm telling you was this big when we started. And this is about... Um, oh, about... can we look at what it oh, looks like yeah. underneath? Yeah, sure, certainly. Oh, the view you never get. And you like that for a root ball. Wow. It's happy. And you see those white roots show that they're happy and they're aerated, they're, they're getting their, all, everything they want. And what would they look like if they were unhappy? They're brown. brown. Yeah. Yeah, that's when they're not happy. So some of them aren't as happy, this isn't as happy. And you can see the color difference. And then we put these in here and this actually picks up, um, it's a, um, um, a matrix for some of the bacteria. Yeah, so I mean, this is what you can do in a 20 by 20. A 20 by 20. 20 by 20. Wow, it's very inspiring. I wish we had more strawberries, but my kids come out here every day and they pick them. So uh, we, we don't have any left. They've been picked over. So the fish are feeding in the water, and that water is directly pumping up to the strawberries. The yes. strawberries filter it the yeah. first time. Into here, yes. And then it goes through these series of tables. Yeah, these tables all fill up randomly, and they, and they discharge randomly. Um, 
Yeah, and so you can see these tomatoes here. This is about a month of growth here. We uh, grew these from seed and they're just now starting to flower. And later on, I'll show you my wind turbines, which I've designed. And um, they're gonna be incorporated in this system. Right now, I have a one-third horsepower pump running this whole thing. And I'm going to replace that with the wind turbines. Wow, so, so, so it'll, you're be gonna see. it'll be completely off the grid. The only thing that I don't do now is I am feeding the fish with um, a commercial grade feed and uh, uh, we're going to eventually uh, grow our own um, uh, feed for them, uh, duckweed. So we're, wow. hoping, we're hoping that works out. How do you know that your system's functioning properly? We, um, uh, initial testing, I was testing every day initially to get the water right. The, um, <clears throat> the ammonia level on, I think all these uh, systems spike because the fish do it. And it's almost like the ballpark, if you build it, they will come. Well, if you have the ammonia, then you'll get the bacteria in these biofilters that will then convert the uh, ammonia into nitrites, and then from nitrites, another bacteria into nitrates. So it's once you get all that, then you get plants that are happy. And so can you tell just by walking out here that everything's functioning properly? I can just look at the plants, yeah. If there's too much flow, these will overflow. There's water up inside here. These, if there's not enough flow, these won't cycle, so they won't go up and down. So yeah, pretty, it's pretty easy. I spend about five minutes a day out here, and um, that's enough to take care of all the uh, maintenance. I have some sediment filters here. When this filter gets full, unlike changing a filter on the car, I reverse these valves and I back flush. I take the energy that's going up to here and I back flush this into these filters. And how these filters work <clears throat> is the dirt, dirty water comes in here and slowly fills up the barrel. The cleanest water is at the top, the heavy uh, fall, and the cleanest water goes to there, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. By the time you get to the fourth barrel, the water's relatively clean. Then you turn the valves off, the water cycles back into the tank, and that's how you clean it. What you're left with is a kind of a goo here that is a fish emulsion that is really good for uh, growing in dirt. So my neighbor uh, grows in dirt, so nothing goes to waste. Nothing, goes, Nothing to goes to waste. And about how much water do you have in circulation at, at any time in this system? Um, right now we have 2,500 gallons. And, and I know you harvest the plants, but do you also harvest your fish? Well, you can. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, we're starting to name them. And oh. it's difficult to eat something you've named. So, but yes, you can. We have about uh, 120 fish in there. And they range anywhere from that big to uh, little guys. What kind of fish do we have They're in They're tilapia. There they go. Tilapia is one of those species that, you know, it's introduced here in Hawaii, yes. so people sometimes have a bad feeling about it. Can you tell us why tilapia is good in this application? Well, tilapia are very hardy, and, and you're going to need that. Um, not so much for the temperature, because um, the temperature is fairly uh, stable. It's about 74 degrees in the water. Um, but the tilapia have a wide range of pH and ammonia tolerances that they can do it. In fact, they can actually live in brackish, semi-brackish water. Um, so even if your pond isn't the cleanest and all that, you're not going to have a lot of fish die off. They, um, they also have um, a catfish, but they have their own uh, issues. And barramundi, which I'm going to look into. Oh. So barramundi is <laughs> the next thing we're going to look into and see from if they Australia, can go. From Australia, right? It, I, I would imagine yes. It sounds like they're from Australia. <laughs> I, I personally don't know for a fact. But, um, but we're going to try to introduce them and see if we can uh, get them to coexist. We've been real happy. We haven't lost one fish, not one casualty out of all the fish. You know, it's a funny thing. We actually spend much less time watching television and we sit out here as a family with a little flame and we listen to the water and the whole bit and it's really nice. It's better for our family. So it's a positive in that way too. Do you mind if I ask the cost of setting up a system like this? Well, I this? built everything myself and designed it all myself so the labor is not in there. But um, uh, something like this, we had an initial budget of $2,000 and we exceeded it uh, <laughs> by a little bit as you can see. But um, I would say we're probably somewhere in the $3,500 range. Wow. Yeah. And, but what you have here is not only practical, it's a really beautiful setup, I imagine. Yeah. That yeah, so a lot of it was kind of, you know, pretty stuff too, yeah. Setup. You know, that's, that's set up over there where we sit, you know, in the rock and, and everything. If you wanted to do it bare bones, yeah, it could, you could do it a lot cheaper. I run a single one-third horsepower pump. A one-third horsepower pump. It costs pump. me about a dollar a day. Wow. Okay, now I hope to get rid of that dollar a day with my wind turbines, which I'd like to show you. The University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program, focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, 
safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. I became uh, interested in building vertical axis wind turbines, okay? And so I did a little bit of research and I thought that a lot of the systems they had were flawed. And uh, so I decided to make my own. And what I was using initially for blades, which we'll see later, are PVC pipe, which I would cut into one third no pieces. Way. That's PVC, that's a pipe cut into a third. And what I decided to go with after that is high density polyethylene. And, and this is, it, it's heavy. Well, yeah, now pick the two up to, at the same time. And you'll notice this is quite a bit lighter. Ah. Now pick that one up, yeah, so you feel it. So what I decided was instead of using the PVC pipe, which has issues with UV, um, uh, they, they degrade in UV, um, I, mil I built this, this tool to make my own blades. And what this does is you heat the plastic up and you put it in flat and it's like a waffle maker and then you make your waffles, all right? And so that's how you do it. And then these are water cooled, so they keep the same temperature, and you're able to make these. Oh. And so how did you build this metal piece? Um, I, I did a CAD, uh, a CAD uh, design, and uh -huh. I took it over to Precision Water Cutting in uh, Lahaina, and they cut the pieces and welded it together. This mechanism is going to cool and help you to shape the polyethylene into the blade, but Correct. how do you heat it up? That's a good question. I didn't, it wouldn't fit in the uh, oven, so I had to make my own oven. <laughs> oh and my so God. what I did was I took an old refrigerator and I repurposed it. And this is, as far as I know, Maui's largest uh, convection oven. So what happens is I have a heating element in here and I have a blower here, which blows hot air throughout here. I get the polyethylene up around 100, 240 degrees. Um, it gets pliable enough to then go into the mold. It'll hold 50 blanks at a time. And then they go in hot, you wear gloves, because it is, and you shove them in, and then you, you do the process where you, you do it. Now, see, this one right now is, is um, it's cold, so it won't uh, take the mold. And then there's a water, a water um, tank in here that uh, keeps the temperature uh, constant. Did you experiment around with the blade shape before you well, made this Well, I did these, model? and I knew approximately what I wanted. And then I'll show you the, the results outside. So, wind turbines. Wind turbines. I uh, built these to harness the wind here, and we have plenty of it. And um, I found that solar here is difficult because the salt um, corrodes them. And so they have difficulty lasting the 10 years that they're warrantied. But these here, I've been running for four years, and we haven't had any problems with them. Um, right now, these are not connected to the grid. Uh, these are just test uh, turbines. But you can see we have wind of about I'd say it's about eight, eight miles an hour right now. So that device up there, it's uh... yeah, tell it's linked to a computer and then tells me what it is. These have been spinning for about uh, about four years. Now I have the record for Maui because no vertical axis wind turbine has lasted more than a year in Maui. Well, that was actually going to be my first question because mostly here we see the pinwheel style wind right, turbines. Right, right, the propeller kind, the bird choppers, whatever you want to call them. Right. They, um, they have uh, a couple inherent problems. Number one, they're more efficient, so I'm going to give them their due up front. But number two, they, they, uh, they, have, um, they have to be facing the wind at all times. Uh -huh. So if you're the wind, they always sure. have to come back to you. The problem with that is the wind, as you can feel here, is gusty. It comes from different directions. Uh -huh. And in the time it takes for it to orient itself, they get vibration on the tip of the blades, and that's where the cavitation and the vibration comes from. Um, so they're loud. Anytime you have something like that, you're constantly working the material, and eventually some of them fail. These right here are in harmony with nature. They don't seem to um, have that, uh, that problem. These are called drag units. And not because they're a drag, but because it's like a swimmer. And they cup the air and they, and they move it. Unlike an airplane wing, which is the type that Maui Electric has, uh -huh. which is called a lift unit, and it has an airplane wing, and it actually can go faster than the speed of the wind. The wind. This, if it can get to a one-to-one -one with the wind, you're doing great. So um, these have been great. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career 
Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world a difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA. You're watching Voice of the Sea. Pound for pound or yeah, I guess dollar for dollar. <laughs> wind speed per wind speed, these are going to generate less electricity. Only because, yeah, if you have a circle and you have the wind blowing in a single direction, only one third of the blades are in power. As opposed to if you have a propeller, all of the propellers are in power at once. So they have less surface area into the wind at any one time. The trade-offs, absolutely dead quiet. There's no noise. There's no vibration uh -huh. from these. That's that's the trade-off. So would you rather have something that made a lot of noise and you only had one or you had three and they made no noise and you don't even know they're up there? So a rack like this, these are different ones. I don't have them all um, uh, operating right now, but a rack like this would be enough power to power my home. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so that the one that's spinning is the same setup? It's the same. As the, yeah. This is a three blade. Okay. And these are five blade. Why, why is there this piece in the center? Why okay. is it in two parts? Okay, that's a perfect question, perfect question. Okay, initially, the first generation, this is second generation, first generation, went, the blades went from the top all the way to the bottom. Uh -huh. As they spun, um, centrifugal force pulled the blade out, sure. and they would actually come out about that far. They'd actually, you know, fatten up an uh -huh. inch or so. And that was a real issue. So I realized that the materials I were, was using um, couldn't sustain that much length, 60 inches. Uh -huh. So I chopped it in half and then uh, I splayed it where this is 60 degrees off of this. So the top cage and the bottom cage are, are out of sync with each other. And what that does is it gives you a smoother, um, instead of the wind pushing and then the next one comes in, think of, Think of a Harley Davidson at a, at a stoplight, boom, 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 <laughs> and think of um, think of a Honda, mm, right? Because there's more cylinders. This ha would basically be more cylinders by sp splitting it and splitting it. And oh, because it's offset like that. Yes. Is what you're now saying. these here, I'll stop one of these. These are actually two cages in one. So you have a top cage and a bottom cage, and you can adjust them any way you want. Um, and this design is better for a uh, module uh, type build because you can take this and you can go four high, you can go one high or three high. So this is actually um, the design that we're going with. And I noticed you just stopped that with your bare hands. Yeah, oh yeah, no. You can't hurt yourself with these. My kids used to ride their bikes around these when they were down on the ground. And so unlike a propeller, which will hurt you, um, these are very, very safe. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want to get in between the two of them, but, but, you know, shy of that, not so bad. And so I hear you talking about a lot of different designs that you've tried. Yep. And this a lot is second generation. I'm up to the fifth generation. And how did you go about that experimentation process? Um, I built a wind turbine. I, went, I built a wind tunnel, 112 scale model, which I now hope to build at the college next summer, uh, a full scale size. And um, I can show you that later. But uh, that, I would build little miniatures and then test them out in miniature. Then I would build them one quarter scale, one half scale, and then finally full scale. And did you talk to people along the way or no. read about? No. no, no, this is all my own designs. Yeah, I don't want to be polluted by somebody else, somebody else's failure. <laughs> because if somebody had a really good one, we'd all be buying them <laughs> right now. So no, um, I pretty much, um, I, I go on my own, uh, my own designs. And what about the, the conversion to power? So you have these things spinning around. Oh yeah, around. Th these are easy. Um, I have a gearbox that I'm, um, I'm currently formulating or, or putting together right now that puts three of these, three cells, the base of it goes into a gearbox and all the energy from the three uh, wind turbines goes into a single turbine uh, gearbox and then a single generator is then attached to it. And uh, that can be placed very easily. These pop out in five minutes. So you could put a cage down on somebody's roof or are there trellis like this. You can pop in the different components and hook it up and literally in a, in a half an afternoon or so, you could have it up and running. So what would you tell somebody like me who's maybe not as mechanically inclined? Like where would I start? Average homeowner to build, unlike the aquaponics, I think they could do that a little easier. Uh -huh. um, 
these are more difficult because the angle of attack and everything like that is really, these have been pretty fine tuned at this point. Um, again, it's been four years. So, um, but I have uh, put a program out to Molokai that I would be willing to cut the patterns and the blades and send them over there and they could assemble and install um, as a program to kind of get some jobs over there and, and such. So we're working on a lot of different things. So this knowledge is, is moving out Oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to allow a lot of this knowledge here because this right here, these are fairly efficient. The the final ones I'm going to do, um, I, I'll probably end up marketing it at one point. Your whole house is it's a giant science. It's experiment. a giant science experiment, you know, burn ratios and things like that uh, down below. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I'm very impressed. I think aesthetically, the things that you're showing are kind they're just beautiful. Yeah, they're kind of fun. Those are yeah. actually more graceful. But they're less powerful, so we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to uh, find a happy medium, like with the fish and the plants, and that's what these are. Um, these will end up; these are 110 pounds each. They will end up uh, made out of all polyethylene. They're only 70 pounds. These over here, oh, forgot this. These over here, if you can get a low shot down there, a really low shot with the sun at your back, those are magnetic levitated uh, bearings. So these are floating on a magnetic cushion. You'll just notice that there's a little tiny gap in between the, the round plastic and the square plastic. Wow. Kind of cool, huh? So I'm playing around with both mechanical bearings and magnetic levitation bearings. And they're very, very powerful, very powerful. The magnets just in there will pick up 500 pounds. So they're scary strong. Um, and they'll repulse 80 pounds. So, wow. so those are kind of cool. The problem is, is they're very susceptible to corrosion. And there's a lot of corrosion. So that's the thing about the wind power is there's always a moving element to yes. it. So something that could wear down. Well, that could wear out. These are on bearings that I've been playing around with the different bearings. And the bearings are lasting. Even these bearings here, which are fairly inexpensive ones, they're uh -huh. lasting a year and a half. So um, that wouldn't be the end of the world. You'd have to replace a set of bearings at maybe um, maybe $20 a set. So it's not, it's not that uh, cost prohibitive. Where are we going from here? Well, initially this was for uh, powering this house. It's gone beyond this now. I've had so much um, um, interest in these that I now teach classes at the, at the college, Vitek, um, when they'll have me. And I've actually taught a class, um, a day class, um, uh, and I've been honored to be able to do that. And the kids are excited. They come and they look at this and I show them the video and they're so excited about all this. And uh, that's the key, is to get them excited and stop get, thinking that electricity comes from a wall plug, right? You know, and we don't know where that, you know, the coal fire or the, or the oil fire like that. This is free. This is, this is what's given to us, and so let's use it. So some people say it's too windy where you live. That's the lemons, and this is the lemonade. So I, I think that this is really um, how we all should do. And I don't think that this is so out there that everybody couldn't have it, especially in... Uh, um, windy areas like this. This just makes sense. Every one of these houses could have this. So this is this is where I want to take it and um, where hopefully we can put them out there and they're going to be very, uh, very inexpensive compared to solar. So if you have wind, this is the way to go. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, Improving Schools, Improving Education, CRDG. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.